Morning. Crops don't look half bad, do they? Well, there's been some major developments since the last time I checked in with you all a week ago. First and foremost, we moved to the farm. We are now living here at one of the main farm houses where Katie used to live, right here next to the red machine shed. For those of you who do not know my dogs, this is O'Malley, male border collie, and this is Murphy, female border collie. They're happy to be out here in this big yard. This is normally where we take them to, you know, throw a ball, let them run, and now they get to live out here. So that's been good so far. To keep them from getting splattered on the road, we had one of those invisible pet fences put in around the yard. They've got two acres to run on here, so I think that'll keep them pretty occupied for the most part. As a matter of fact, O'Malley sees my sister Katie running over there on this back road. So he's kind of alert that something's going on. There's Murphy. What was that for? I don't have anything. What are you trying to get from me? A little bit of dew on the yard today. The dogs are getting kind of wet. That brings me to my next point. It rained while we were gone. And not only did it rain, it rained a lot. We've had five and a half inches of rainfall since last Thursday when I checked in with you all. That is a lot of rain and exactly what we needed to break the major droughty conditions we've had. One or two inches would not have cut it for how dry we are. Five inches though, spread out over a five day period, is about exactly what the doctor ordered. As a matter of fact, it was so dry that one morning it rained three inches and my mom was able to mow her yard a couple hours later in the afternoon or around noon because all of that water absorbed right into the ground and dried up quickly. She said you couldn't even tell it had rained. So we're at five inches now, the ground is a little bit damp, but I would say that our crop is effectively saved for now. Actually, if we keep getting rain at this point, our crop may actually start getting water damaged, so the pendulum might have swung the other direction, but we needed that rain because our corn was tasseling, it's fully tasseled now. Things were starting to look a little bit grim if we didn't get rain. Now everything looks about as good as it could given the growing season we've had so far. It's a very stark difference from when we left to go up to Michigan. The crops have grown almost astronomically because of the rain. These beans probably put on eight inches of growth in the last couple of days. Corn is nice, flush, even, and tasseled. I really think that although we have lost some top and yield potential, there's no reason we still can't produce above average crops as long as we have a good finish to the season. The unfortunate part is there is a lot of work left to be done. Obviously, I've been very busy this week with moving and doing some other stuff. I need to get back over to the farm and get the sprayer ready to spray some bean fungicide because I'm gonna be rolling on that as soon as the ground dries up, probably in the next couple of days. You guys going inside or hanging out here? What's the plan? In my humble opinion, there are few things in this world as important as faith, family, and land. And that's exactly why I wanna to talk to you about today's sponsor, Discount Lots. Discount Lots is making land purchasing easy for everyone. It's quite literally like the Amazon of purchasing lots and properties at discounted prices across the United States. It's quick, easy, and affordable, and you could get started just by going to discountlots.com and looking at their diverse portfolio of land. If you find something on there that's of interest to you, all you do is add it to your cart and voila you're done. To cut down on unnecessary fees and hassles that you have to deal with with other providers and marketplaces like this, the team at Discount Lots handles everything. You can finance in-house with payments as low as $240 per month and they don't even run any credit checks. It's very quick and easy. If you use code DLTRIPPY10 at checkout, you can get 10% off of your order today. Even if you're not in the market for a property today, do yourself a favor and head over to discountlots.com, check out their offerings, and maybe you just might stumble across your dream property. Use code DLTRIPPY10 if you do for 10% off. Thanks to Discount Lots for sponsoring today's video. Now back to the regularly scheduled programming. The bad part about living this close to the farm now is that I really do not have a good excuse for being late to work anymore because work is right out my front door. In completely ironic fashion, today I have to start by driving into town to go to our John Deere dealership to get the row feelers for my Hagee for spraying corn fungicide. Alrighty, quick trip, talked to Colton, the Hagee expert, got what we needed and really all of the insight we need as well. We're ready to go put these row feelers on and do a few other things for a spraying operation. You can tell harvest is next on the list based on how many corn heads, drapers, and combines there are floating around the lot. My dad did manage to get his corn head storage trailer situation figured out. 
swapped out that easy trail for this Unverfirth that seems to be handling the weight a lot better. I'm not an engineer by any means, but the fact that that main bar in the back is not bowing at a pretty substantial angle means that this cart is in fact now heavy enough for a 12 row folding corn head. I don't have the specifications on this head. I know though that corn heads, especially folding corn heads, are extremely heavy, definitely in comparison to a draper. Drapers aren't as much material as they look like because a majority of the front of a draper is the belts that don't really weigh that much, at least not as much as steel and cast iron and all the other junk that's on a corn head. We've got a few months though to worry about picking corn, so we'll put that to the wayside. Right now I need to make some adjustments to the Hagee, put the row feelers on, also put some spacers on my in nozzles, I'll talk about that later, and replace the sight tubes on my tanker trailer. Probably gonna do all this in the reverse order. I disconnected the hose clamps on the bottom ones a few weeks ago and pulled them off. I gotta climb up here and do the top ones. A ladder is probably a safer choice, but I don't have a ladder within close proximity. About a 50 foot roll of one inch clear tubing. I'll just put it side by side with what I took off and cut the same length and replace it. You can kind of see, here's the bottom, here's the top. Bottom is stained much more because it's spent more time with chemical in it. Really the top doesn't see a whole lot of chemical because we never load the trailer that full. I would speculate that a majority of this milky stain is probably the Acuron GT and the Atrazine from corn. Although the Roundup, the Liberty, everything contributes to making these things this dirty. I must have flip-flopped him because the other one was too long and this one is almost a shade too short. If anything, it's actually closer to perfect, which is unusual for my work. First project went way better than expected, which is always concerning. I've got to take a short recess from the next two because my wife is having a couch delivered to our house down the road this morning. It's also the same reason why I'm back to making YouTube videos because almost out of money from all the furniture she's bought. There's the old ball and chain. Glad to see it survive the wind and the storms while we were gone. We're gonna go ahead and put these row feelers on. They go on the front wheels. Here are the little troublemakers. This one will go on the left tire and that one will go on the right tire. Basically they work the same as the row sense on a corn head. Yeah, if I'm being completely honest, that's not what I expected either. It's kind of flaccid, I think, is what the term you'd use. The row feelers on a corn head are metal. I believe that is ready to go. I'm not gonna put the shield back on because I wanna turn it on once I get the other one on and make sure that the sensor is actually work properly. Row feelers are installed on both sides. Obviously I gotta put the shields back on. I'm gonna fire the Hagee up and see if it detects these things. Let's fire her up. Whew, kind of musty in here. Probably one of those research and development jugs of foliar fertilizer I spilled on the floor. There's what we're looking for right there. Crop sensors have been detected. Turn them on. I won't need these for spraying beans, but it looks like they work. The next project is actually on the nozzle bodies and tips on the booms. I need to put some extensions on. I have to unfold it and get it down to my short height to be able to do that. So we'll do that and then I'll kind of talk you through what's going on up there. I noticed when I was spraying Liberty with these turbo twin jet T-jet nozzles 
that the pattern was starting too high on the more recessed areas of the wet boom, specifically on the winglets. The inner wings actually sit a little bit better, so it's not as big of a deal. And some of that pattern was hitting up against the frame. It's really only an issue with the twin jets because like I said, they start shooting at a more aggressive angle higher up as opposed to the regular extended range fans that kind of shoot straight down and out. The temporary solution, or really the only solution other than running a different nozzle, is to put in these extenders. Basically, I'll pop these all off, put this extender on, and then put the nozzle on the end of it, and it'll just bridge another inch to inch and a half, roughly guessing there, and that should allow the pattern to clear the frame of the wing. It wasn't really a huge deal, I noticed, but it was enough that I was wasting some product. In hindsight, I should have done this before I sprayed my Liberty with the twin jets, but I was putting on 20 gallons an acre and it looked like it was still doing a decent job covering. Now though, I definitely want to hunker down. We're trying to get great coverage as we spray corn, soybean, fungicide. So I'm going to go at least to the wings, the outside 30 foot and put these drops on and maybe the center section. Alrighty, 30 minutes of work and a little bit of loafing later because Bill Upoff stopped by to talk about some custom corn fungicide application for his family. And we've got our extensions on. You can kind of see here where they stick out a little bit below the actual boom itself. On the front row, I doubled up and we won't use the front for corn fungicide, but I did notice that issue with it fanning against the frame being even worse on the front. So I hope that the doubles take care of that. I said a million times, this is all a learning process for me. We're gonna fire the heggy up, run the rinse tank through and spray and see if we're clearing all the nozzles. gallon rinse tank really does not last that long so I better get up there and shut it off before I run the pump dry. I think since I'm kind of just in a holding pattern right now waiting on the ground to dry up a little bit and the crops to mature a little farther I may just go ahead and put the corn boom on the back that's because the front boom all of that product that you would theoretically be applying will wipe right off under the bottom of the heggy you'll kind of push the corn over as you go across it spraying corn so that's why you put the back boom on take it off when you're spraying herbicides throughout the year just to keep it from rattling around i'm going to put it back on i don't have to turn it on there's a t-valve up front that redirects the center section to the back and there's also a valve here on the back so i'll just put it on and get ready to go Okay, another part of the project done. I got this back section of the wet boom hooked up. It's also plumbed in. There's just a little one inch banjo fitting right here. It plugs into. Had a few extra T-Jet twin jets. That's what I'm spraying all of our fungicide with. So just went ahead and put those on. I won't use the front section of the front boom and this back part at the same time. So if I need an extra, I can always steal one from the other. One thing I do want to note is that this was already bent before I had anything to do with it. It's probably gonna look a little bit canted when it's up. I'm gonna go ahead and flip the T-valve on the front that redirects that center section. I'm gonna run a little product through and just make sure all of these nozzle bodies are in working shape. It's never a good sign when more of them are not working than are working. It's like these three right here are good and this one and the remainder all need replaced. Oh, finally got it working. I am not proud of how long that took. I also managed to get a bath in the process. At least it was 95% water, just a little bit of fungicide, no insecticide or herbicide. Still, probably gonna take a shower first thing when I get home because it's gonna be good. The good part about living at the farm is you don't have to go far to do your Sunday evening scouting to see what's gonna spray on Monday morning. We're looking for maturity on our soybeans, hitting that R3 growth stage, and we're also looking at ground conditions. As a matter of fact, it's actually on the wet side now after about two months of very little rain and mostly dry conditions, it's flip-flopped and now we're actually seeing pockets out here in the field of soybeans that are showing some yellowing from water damage. It's funny how quickly you can get on the opposite side of the coin on that one. We've got the whole crew in here, Allie, Lenny, we've been moving all day, it takes a lot of time and energy to move two different houses so that's been consuming a lot of our time before too long we're going to be hopping in the hakey here and spraying some fungicide so we're going to go check some fields ground conditions are obviously important because i have a ground rig i have to be able to actually get across the soil to apply things without getting stuck half inch of rain the other day after we spent a lot of time working on the hakey that next night some rain came down 
things are getting a little bit sticky, but I'll take the rain because that means we're getting plenty of moisture for our crops to continue to progress and hopefully put on some pretty big yields. This is the first field of beans we planted. Asgro 33 XF3 Extend Flex Soybeans. It is a 3-3 maturity, so on the early side for what we normally plant. If anything is going to be ready, it's going to be those early group threes, especially those that were planted earlier. There is an economically optimum time to make this pass on your soybeans. It is at R3 growth stage I mentioned earlier. R3 is classified as a 5 16 of an inch pod on one of the upper four fully developed nodes on your soybean plant, but less than three quarters of an inch pod because once it gets that big, you start to look at R4 soybeans. Now, you're not going to lose a lot of yield on this application of fungicide and insecticide by missing that pinpoint R3 spot. But if you're wanting to do everything perfect, you'd get it applied before everything gets past that R3 because that's where your money is best spent. So here's some nice looking 20 inch row 33 XF3s. I can tell you without even looking at these too much that we may have actually missed the optimum window because you look at some of these big old pods on here, you've got one trifoliate, two, three, and four. Now on that fourth trifoliate, we've actually got probably inch plus pods. So these are past R3, meaning they're gonna be quick on my list to get done. Ground feels fairly firm out here. I'll be able to spray these first things tomorrow, I believe. I have a few other fields of 33 XF3s planted on the same day or on the same couple of days. I think I can make a safe assumption that I don't need to check them all. They're probably all ready to spray based on the way these ones look. The fungicide we're applying is to help fight fungal pathogens. Frog eye leaf spot is one of the big ones we're trying to counteract. There's a few other ones that are pretty common on soybean plants, rust, and some other stuff. One thing you can see if you have a trained eye is all this insect feeding on our leaves. That insect feeding is primarily the result of Japanese beetles. I just saw a few of them flying around. There's one right there. They're all over the place. We will put an insecticide with the product to specifically target these hard-shelled insects like Japanese beetle that defoliate quite a bit of our soybeans. Combination of fungicide and insecticide has been a pretty surefire seven to eight bushel per acre bump for us on our soybeans for the last 10 years. It'll take about two bushel an acre to pay for this pass. So if we get two bushels, we're green. And if we get seven or eight, we've got a five or six bushel profit. That's why we spray every acre every year with fungicide and insecticide. To summarize what I'm going to do this evening, drive around, look at fields, look at different maturities of soybeans planted on different dates and decide whether or not I I should be spraying them based on growth stage and then I'll ask myself is it dry enough to get the Hagee out here because if I can get the Hagee out here I'm gonna put them on my list tomorrow because I need to get spraying rain in the forecast mid next week and I don't really want to pay for a helicopter and airplane at this point seeing as I've got quite a bit invested in a ground rig to do it myself the nice thing is if you catch a rogue water hemp or something that didn't get killed you can go ahead and just take them out of their misery Lenny and Allie are hanging out in the truck. Lenny's been shouting out the window this whole time. I'm sure he'd love to come out and scout, but I prefer to keep him out of the bug-ridden soybean fields this time of year. Just down the road to the south of the farm, we checked a minute ago. These are some Don Mario 3-4s. They're 34 E11s in list. A little bit later, just a smidge in those 3-3s three from Asgro we just checked and planted about 10 days, if I had to guess, after those 3-3s three were planted. It'll be interesting to see how these have progressed. This is a pretty wet farm, so ground conditions here are going to be even more pertinent to our decision making. And of course, we want to make sure the beans are close to that R3. You can actually see the soybeans are not enjoying these damp feet. See some lower leaves here starting to droop. Not ideal. Overall, though, that's pretty good for this farm. If there's any year this farm would enjoy, it's probably a drought year. But I would say we did lose some yield from some standing water out here. It's not as evident on top, but you look down like I just showed you, there is some clear signs. Well, this right here is a sprayer track from a few passes ago. We look at these beans, one, two, three, fourth trifoliate. There's a tiny little pod starting to form there. If you go to the fifth form trifoliate, there is a 5 16 of an inch pod, but that's still technically R2. If these were dry given rain in the forecast, I'd probably go ahead and spray them, but they actually, are a little bit soft. If you're sinking in the ground a little bit with boots on, you know the ground rig is going to sink. 
We may give these another two days and just send it if we get an opportunity. As for the maturity and the development of these, one, planting date does matter. Even though they're classified as a certain group, one planted two weeks after the other may not mature as quickly. It's very marginal, especially come harvest, but this time of year you can actually notice the difference. The other thing you're seeing is that although it is a 3-4 bean according to Don Mario, a Don Mario 3-4 classification bean may not be the same as an Asgro 3-4. Every seed company kind of has their own discretion about how they want to label beans. So if they want to put it as a 3-4, there's really no governing body to say, hey, that's not a 3-4, other than your farmer may be getting upset if you label a short season bean when it's actually a little bit longer. That's kind of the confusing part. One company's 3-3 may not be the same as another company's. Yeah, that's gonna need a few days of sunshine. Fast forward the next day, I scouted about 800 acres that is ready to spray and ironically most of it is in fairly firm shape in terms of ground condition. It is Monday, I think I'm good to spray on Tuesday, the rain is moving in on Wednesday afternoon. What I think I'm going to do because I only have 800 acres ready in terms of maturity is just wait until Tuesday, give the ground another day to dry up a little bit, that way I'm not running through mud. One more day in the summer should make a big difference in terms of drying things up. We're gonna work on a few other things today and then tomorrow we're gonna hopefully have a big day in the Hagee spraying soybean fungicide. I'm gonna hop in the truck, run a few errands, and then we're going to do some other work that's been needing to get done for the last month or so. The dogs are gonna stay here in the yard and hopefully burn off some energy. After two months of waiting, it's finally time to winterize our spring equipment. Field cultivators have been parked outside. We just need to power wash them, grease them, and put some fresh sweeps on for next season. The planters need the row units disassembled, also washed off and unhooked. The corn planter can be unhooked. The bean planter needs to stay hooked on because they still have not fixed that carrier frame that is bent. the planters most of these tractors have not left the shed in two months now we finished up our spring work unhooked our tillage implements ahead of a storm and then pulled the tractors inside once Jeff's done washing the frame off of this field cultivator he'll pull that one out of the way start changing the sweeps I'll back this tractor up to that field cultivator hook it up start that same process just lagging a little bit behind This is the newer one. Definitely want to give the brand new field cultivator a thorough walk around before we put it away. Since it is new, it does come with a one year warranty. If there was any issues this spring, now's the time to get it fixed because by the time we pull it out of the shed next year, that warranty will be gone. So now is definitely the opportunity to get stuff fixed for free. And rightfully so, but it seems to have been a pretty reliable machine. I can saw a ton of acres. All the seed corn is cleaned out of the planter. Units are disassembled. I took the parts over to Dad's house for storage. Keep the mice out of them. I'm gonna keep power washing on this. Once that's done, we'll go back to working on the field cultivators. There's a lot of different moving parts right now. Jeff's been working on the field cultivators. He got them clean. We'll put new sweeps and grease them. Once this is power washed, we'll grease this and then dog get put away. I don't know what the plan is for the bean planter. I guess technically we could take the plates out and the seed out of it, but we'll see what the boss man wants to do when that time comes.
washed off, greased up, and ready for winter storage. We're on pace right now to have the corn planter done in both field cultivators today, which is pretty good for a morning and afternoon's work. This is field cultivator two out of two completed. Put about 75% new sweeps on this one. This one is the brand new one. I'm not even sure if Katie changed any sweeps this year. It just didn't wear out that much. Just Dad and I now, Jeff had to take off. We're gonna put this in the shed, see if we can get unhooked without damaging anything. First one's already tucked away. I will say that I chose the wrong day to wear a long sleeve black shirt to work. Sun's warm. I also put on some sunscreen to help protect my face and it seems to make you feel hotter. Obviously it's protecting you from the sun, but at the same time, makes being outside less enjoyable. You could not wash a field cultivator and just putting a brand new set of painted black sweeps on there would make it appear like it's brand new. Just because that's really the most obvious point on the machine for analysis. You can see the rusty ones on the back that we ran this season. The new black ones make the entire field cultivator look new. I better be on the lookout for dad here. He may only have one good working arm. He can still do damage like he's got two good working arms. These newer style field cultivators must be longer than the ones we've ran historically because normally we could fit both of our older field cultivators and then the vertical till right here, but we're pretty much out of space here. If we put a vertical till there, we're gonna be blocking half of this south door, which is not something we really wanna do. It just reiterates the point that you can never build the shed big enough. You never know when you're gonna buy a DB60 or a Hagee or anything like that and not have the space you probably need. I would imagine this planter is going to be the last thing we get unhooked this afternoon. We were making pretty good pace until we put all those sweeps on the field cultivator. That was a lengthy project, among other things. Good news, don't have to worry about the planter rusting this off season. Fired the tractor up and the return line valve was stuck open. So instead of being the return line, which is how the planter would put hydraulic oil back into the reservoir and system, it was just gushing out of there. And you can see by this nice puddle of oil and on the planter, it was coming out pretty good. Thankfully, we weren't standing behind there, although it wouldn't be the first time we got a bath of oil. I could use a bath of something right now because I'm awfully sweaty. Dad's back in the vertical till end. I'm not sure if he's unhooking it or what the plan is there. I'm gonna follow with the bean planter. We're not doing anything with it other than putting it back in the shed. I'm on my last camera battery on hand. It's about out of juice. I got to put another tractor in and then I'm gonna pull the Heggie up to the fuel tank, get ready for a big day of spraying soybean fungicide tomorrow. So that's gonna be it for me today. As always, I greatly appreciate every single one of you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you wanna see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.